Welcome and good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Guglielmo Lulli. I'm chairing the, my role is just to chair in this uh, session. I'm a professor at Lancaster University. And basically, I will take your Q and A's and obviously I will report your question to the speakers and in order for them to uh, answer. Um, um, I believe you all know the, the that basically there is not really a way for you to interact with the speaker. It's just through the uh, Q and A's. So use the Q and A's for any uh, information that you would like to have. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Michael Schultz. Michael Schultz uh, uh, is a senior researcher, principal investigator at TU Dresden. And after a long period at DLR, he came back home. And obviously his expertise is in uh, art traffic flow management, especially in applying data-driven approach and machine learning. So his talk is about concept of long range ATFM. And so I leave the floor to Michael for his presentation. And then please, Michael, you have 30 minutes for uh, to show uh, your talk. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. I like to share the screen now. So can you can you see the screen? Yes, uh, we do. And so I believe you can start and I know that you also have a video later on to show us. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. So I want to talk about the long range air traffic flow management. And this is a, a work was done together with my, my colleagues, Daniel Lubich and Judit Rosenow here on Dresden site and with Eri Ito, she is from the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics at the uh, Tokyo University and at the same time at the ENRI Research Institute in Tokyo, Japan. And I want to uh, thank uh, Srinivas and Wudong for uh, joining us in this project and they are both with the uh, Air Traffic Management Research Institute in Singapore. So um, the talk today is, is structured and I would say more or less for, for major points. The first one is I want to introduce you the general idea of the long range ATFM, the long range air traffic flow management concept. Then I want to give you an example. Um, we use Singapore Changi Airport environment um, as a, this example environment and all the data we, we use for this, we are extracting from ADSB messages. I will come later on to this. Uh, we are extract the arrival flows and times. Times means uh, locations, positions, and then time to fly to the airport itself. Then we derive from this uh, route network with uh, seven hours to fly until one hours to fly before landing at Singapore airport. And then we show how ADFM regulation could somehow help to uh, decrease the, the pressure on the approach sector by uh, somehow dealing with a good demand and capacity balancing. Uh, we use this idea of uh, losing or gaining speed during the cruise phase. And finally, I want to give you a summary and the outlook. This is just a brief presentation. So if you have any particular questions, I think the paper could answer this. And uh, this is the first paper of, we are thinking a long period of paper coming. So uh, the one or the other point, it's just this general concept, but details will come later. So the, the general concept of uh, air traffic flow management, I think it's easy to understand that we somehow want to manage the, the flow of incoming uh, flights to an airport to somehow help the airport to use its capacities in the best way. Normally, when we are talking about capacity, it's more dealing with the runway system itself, but capacity always means the capacity of the approach sector. And you can see there's sometimes the balancing. That means if the runway is able to, to handle uh, flights very well, then sometimes the airspace, the approach sector becomes the kind of bottleneck. And when the um, approach sector is working very well, then you can sometimes see that the runway capacity, uh, that the runway gets in trouble. So this is somehow balanced. The idea is um, not only dealing with the arrival management, the very local one, um, um, the very local, a system working, but but also with the air traffic flow management, and this is in an easy part in, in Europe. So it's handled by the network manager. So, um, but it's not that easy when you're looking for for other ADFM units in in the world. So the idea is, if there is a chance that you can have some kind of um, target time over reference points, this will be somehow communicated um, or 
determined by the by the local system then you send it to the aircraft flying there is a given time horizon and then you can say okay if this aircraft is handle, able to handle this kind of, of reference point um yeah I'm, I'm i'm still on sorry for asking this okay i i think so I'm not. I'm not quite sure. Sorry, it's my my, my PC just showing showing different things. So if, if I'm on, I will talk. It's okay. Um, yeah, we can we can hear you. It's okay. Okay, sorry for this. No problem. Um, if I have this re reference point, we take two hours here. But you can think it's somehow the idea uh, that we can extend it by three hours, four hours, six hours. Is it just the point? The question is, can we manage somehow aircraft that are flying into the uh, Singapore airport environment? And uh, yeah, this is the idea of the long range ADFM and this long range ADFM, as I said before, is dealing with the Asian Pacific region. So um, I will show a picture later on and you can see Singapore is somehow surrounded and it's a very small region. So it's, you can see it's just like this area. So you have to communicate um, with the uh, ADFM units around you. So there is a, a consensus of the ADFM cooperation in the Asia Pacific area. And um, yeah, this the point um, ADFM arises is that you can only have a very good um, management or regulation procedure if you uh, can control an, a given part of the of the given share of the traffic. So um, normally you go for a seventy up to seventy five percent, and if you say if you can control this, and there's a chance that this kind of regulation will help you to to deal with the capacity problems. So first of all, in the Asian region, uh, when you look for this Singapore and Hong Kong, they are not really served by domestic flights. So there's just a, just a very big city area. And uh, the major airports uh, like uh, Bangkok, Tokyo, or Kuala Lumpur in this area has a um, national traffic, which is far below 30%. So the idea is how they can go real for an ADFM for a flow management. And the idea is the multinodal ADFM concept, which was, which was initiated in 2014. They were saying, OK, they are handling and coordinate their own node independently, and they are connected via a web-based platform. So there is a kind of information exchange between all these uh, ENS, and, uh, ENSP and navigation service providers. Their local decisions, they are going together and they make some kind of uh, collaborative decision making in this big virtual ATFM node. So in May 2014, 39 airports and 11 ANSPs are part of this um, multinodal concept. So what I said before, if you can look for the Singapore area, you can see here, which is a very small area. So it's surrounded by, by all the other flight information, re information region. And so an aircraft uh, which comes from, for example, from, from Germany, from, from Europe, have, have somehow to pass several regions, even very close to the uh, Singaporean airspace. So I think the very first question easily comes. So if Singapore say, I want to have some regulations, it's not that easy to regulate a flight, which is not in your flight region, which is not in your flight region. And of course, which will not be in the flight region along the whole path. So um, this is the major idea. This was the major surrounding. And uh, now I want to show how we try to deal with that. So first of all, we take ADSB messages to somehow follow the path of the incoming traffic. And here you can see a picture. We just want to show the, the major incoming flights into Singapore. So you can see several um, departure airports in Europe. There are some departure airports in the Asian region, region from Australia, from the American continent. This is some kind of uh, network structure we could derive. The ADSB messages, I think these days, lots of us uh, are dealing with this. They normally have the information about the aircraft location, latitude, longitude, altitude information, speed information, origin destinations is uh, somehow covered there as well. The aircraft type registration flight identifier. You can see this data is somehow usable for, for derived networks. So when you look a little bit into detail here, you can see uh, on, on, the, on the left side, um, there are some uh, three rings around um, Singapore airport. We're just taking the 100, 200, and 300 nautical miles and just wanted to, to show, okay, these are 
entry points into the Singaporean airspace, and here you can see different direction. When we first draw these pictures, we try to get a um, better understanding where the flight's coming from, which speed, which height, and then we uh, take another picture and then we say, okay, um, this on the left side is a distance-based thing. Now we've uh, thought about, okay, what's when you're thinking about time? So we take, for example, here, a two hours time picture to say, uh, to get an idea. And uh, here on the right side, um, the small picture, you can see this is only 30 minutes away from landing. And so you can see this come somehow con the flights converges um, to this. Here we use an um, k-means algorithm just to show, okay, these are some clusters. Um, this kind of clustering here on the left side, we are using kernel density estimation and try to uh, implement the mean shift algorithm, not trying doing. And uh, this algorithm somehow helps you to, to identify um, major uh, arrival directions. And in this picture, you can see we identified at least nine major arrival directions when you're entering the, the Singaporean airspace, having in mind that this could be two hours away, one hour away. So this idea we got, so we have now the idea where the flights come from in terms of direction, and we can see that we can easily use ADS-B data uh, for this approach. But I have to say, dealing with ADS-B data means that um, the data have to be cleaned. Uh, we have to uh, reject some wrong trajectories. Wrong trajectories could be trajectories with uh, not too much points uh, or positions available wrong positions, um, all the things you, 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 can, you can think about. And we finally got, I think, 96,000 uh, flights available. And we have to reject uh, uh, roughly 10% of the flights. But there are still a, a number of flights that were not part of the ADSB. So but finally, we say, OK, for our uh, approach or for our concept, it's OK to use the, the data since we just could somehow rebuild the, the airport or we can see the standard airport behavior. And standard airport behavior saying, OK, in the morning, you see there is not so much traffic in, in, uh, at 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock. But then over the day, you can see this typical behavior of a hub where you can have some waves of arrival and departure. Here you can see a picture of the, the whole movements over the day. And we just use this kind of uh, statistic representation to show, OK, it's a 50% quantile. You can see this is some kind of an average number of flight movements. But remember, there are at least 10% or 15% of flights are missing. But this picture will be the same. And then you can say it jumps from 50 to 60. So you have some kind of deviation in there as well. So what I went, meant, uh, mentioned before is we're going for the long range ATFM. That, that means we want to somehow control flights or regulate flights which are um, far away from the airport, so on the cruise phase. So the next picture shows you uh, how far aircraft will be away or what is it, if, uh, the, the average flight duration. And you can see, OK, there is a percentage of roughly 40% 40, 40 of uh, two hours or less, and then 60% um, of two, uh, two hours and more. And uh, if you go for a long range ADFM and you look for the initial ICAO paper, they say, OK, you should go in for, for this part, long range ADFM. So long range for them means more than five hours, but it's still a share in Singapore of 20% of the flight that you can try to, to regulate. So um, we, we take this and the first picture from our analysis show this behavior. So, if you try to draw the average location of a flight who is seven hours away from Singapore airport, you will not have the perfect circular. You will have some kind of uh, this behavior where green in this color means we have lots of data. Red, there is no flight incoming or only less data. But you can see here typical behavior. So when you're uh, coming from this direction, the, uh, um, the position is a little bit more far away than coming from this direction. But this, this will be typical wind pattern. So you can see it's uh, not really a circular environment. But, but for the first case, in an easy understanding, we use this circular approach. And then you can see when you go for Singapore airport, in the arrival management, there are the C7, 6, 4, 3, 4, 3, 2, 1 hour. You can, first, you can see there's the deviation is getting smaller in location. And then you can see an aircraft coming in, move somehow to, through a kind of nodes network. So all the, the nodes are connected where um, 
a given number of flights following this path. So there's a chance that the aircraft will arrive, the airport will arrive like this, or the airport could be arrived like that. So you can see not only speed advisory, that's the point we want to aim on. It's, uh, it's interesting. It could be also uh, uh, some kind of rerouting procedure and thinking about how we can get some additional time to lose or gain. So this is a little bit de not deeper analysis, but should, you, should give you some kind of understanding. So when you go for seven hours away and then you try to find, OK, you take this as the average position. When you are seven hours away, you can see there are some flights a little bit more precise in position. This is one flight we recorded over the time. And some flights, you can see there is a bigger deviation. So yeah, we have the, the same like the arrival management. We have to take care about this kind of um, statistics uh, and to try to find, OK, which one of these flights could be part of regulation. So it's easier to regulate flight with higher deviations, or you should somehow uh, regulate this kind of flights. So if you shift it, so they have a clear peak. If you shift them, it could be different. So this will be part of our future research. So identifying at a given point, so we take for this example 1120 and we try to find out, okay, which flights are, are in the air and which flights will land in this kind of period. And here you can see this is the, the chair of the long range ADFM flights and you can see we have here some kind of uh, over demand. So um, we just going up for the for the runway system, but for the approach sector, we just counting the uh, the expected numbers of um, of movements in that area, we counted this uh, as a, some kind of sustainable capacity, and we counted the 20 uh, arrivals in a given time. Uh, it would be uh, would be uh, some kind of, of of limit, and then we can say, okay, this high share of um, long range traffic will somehow exceed this kind of capacity. And our idea was now, okay, when I get a flight which was coming from far out, more than a five hours flight time, and which is already active, how we can shift this kind of distribution you can see here, how we can shift this kind of distribution forward or backward to see if there's a chance to push a little bit away this, um, this peak. Um, yeah, we assume different kind of uh, acceleration and deceleration. So I think it's it's pretty understandable. If you nearly go to the maximum speed, there is no no kind of uh, further acceleration. So we have this in mind as well. But we, as an as, uh, assumption, um, we just take um, um, changes in minutes. So we assume that a flight can can gain or lose one minute per flight hour up to six minutes. We got from uh, the reviewers the point that six minutes is uh, pretty challenging uh, during um, flights. We are, we are aware of this, but we want to try to find out, okay, if there is a good number we should go for. Uh, there are some, um, some tests doing with in Singapore and they are saying that one or two minutes, it's a, it's a good point. So when we're coming for our first results, we set up an optimization problems, um, uh, problem defining as a resource leveling and then we can say, okay, if there's a chance for shifting by one minute, so the paper, uh, we give some numbers, you can see slight changes when we go for two minutes, it's getting more and more better. And finally, we just show the picture of the plus minus six, six minutes we can, uh, we can have for changing a flight gain or losing, then you can say there's a good chance that we really can somehow deal with the uh, over over demand at the uh, approach sector just by uh, giving speed advisories. But I what I showed you before, there's a chance that you have can reroute a little bit in the network as well. So finally, if you take the six minutes, we can go up for uh, a reduced con congestion. We somehow will be able to harmonize, harmonize by using the available capacity best. And uh, yeah, what I mentioned before, the deep peaking somehow appears here. This talk was a little bit about the, the uh, concept of the long range air traffic flow management. So our first assumption was to say, okay, there will be some moderate speed controls um, possibilities to be taking this into account. We see the long range ADFM as a very cool um, concept um, when no network manager is active to somehow um, linking the ADFM region, regional ADFM regulations and local arrival management of so the annual flight. Uh, regulation will help a little bit further and uh, yeah what I think the major point is that there have to be a collaboration between the different ADFM units so we use Singapore uh, Shanghai Airport 
as an uh, as an example and for the next steps we have to go for the day of operations that means uh if you go for a specific flight route uh, statistics not really helps you so uh, there are so many actual data now available and these somehow uh, fix a little bit the the route you would take the airport uh, the aircraft is given the number of passengers and somehow give you the the mass of the aircraft so there are so many fixed variables so we have to bring in this as well and we want to uh, go for agent based simulation to verify our approach there were already some uh, some simulation running so i think we will be able to handle this simulation with some more realistic scenario by the end of the year and we can further process on that topic thank you Uh, okay, do you hear? Okay, yeah, I'm back. Sorry, I had problem to uh, unmute my microphone. Well, first of all, thank you very much, Michael, for uh, this nice presentation. We have a few QAs from the attendees. I would like to start with the first. Uh, um, well, I would like to start with the question of mine, if you don't mind. Um, obviously, I believe that the nature of the traffic patterns and also the structure of the air traffic system it, it may be uh, somehow it's relevant or is a barrier to the implementation um, for, for the concept. What do you think about, you know, to extend this concept like in a European uh, context? Because I believe um, the air traffic system is a, um, you know, a, a major uh, aspect for having this uh, approach working. Yeah, that's it. That's true. First of all, uh, the, the point is, uh, we are talking during the Caesar innovation days, right? And Caesar is single European sky uh, ATM research. So that you can see the single European sky is one of the big challenges, uh, European, uh, the European guys challenging. So it's, uh, we want to have this kind of single European sky because it's then easier to, to, to harmonize our, our local decisions with a more holistic view. But this system is not running, in, for example, in the Asian uh, Pacific region. So I, I think this long range ATFM concept is a very specific for this kind of uh, incoming flows into that area. So they have this very long range uh, flights available. So first of all, yes, we can take this concept to, to any airspace, to any region we want to identify. So the point is we not really care how the systems are uh, operate. So if it's true if I talk to an aircraft seven hours away, it will be somehow in the Saudi Arabian airspace or far away in the world. So it's not that easy to, to bring in my regulation to this kind of airspace. So I think um, this collaboration is, is a backbone. So what we in our concept, we're not de really dealing with this. For us, it's more interesting. And I think the major point is when you're dealing with statistics, it's, it's the one side, but when you're coming to the day of operation, it's, it's get very prominent. So if you have this kind of wind fields active, there will be no way to go other ways because it's getting very inefficient to doing for this. I think this is more prominent and this is, yeah, it's easy how to deal with actual. It's, I think it's the major problem for this concept. Okay, so uh, I have here, obviously, there is a, a list of questions. So one is about uh, how to take uncertainty into account in this study, uh, especially because he's saying that uh, plus six um, um, plus or minus six minutes seems uh, within uncertainty boundaries yeah. when looking at long range flights. Yeah, so, so, so our expert in the team is Judith Rosano. She's dealing with so many flight optimizations, taking care of contrails and uh, finding the right way going through the uh, aviation network. So she, she's asking the same. So she's really uh, curious um, how we can deal with. And what I mentioned before, speed regulation is one point. Rerouting would be the other one. But as I mentioned, the for example, the contrail case, there are so many other boundaries we have to take care uh, during the day of operations so this is part of the future re research so we see at least at the first stage stage there's a chance to do so there's a good chance 
to somehow help the, the local um, yeah, traffic management systems with the long range concept. But uh, finally, yes, you are right at the day of operations, it, it will be a totally different challenge in taking into account what's actually happened in the airspaces around. Will be there some, some active uh, restriction in airspaces, for example, will be some specific wind fields or if, if there are some, some areas on convective weather, uh, will be there some active military areas that could so many things happen around the airport and then you have somehow um, to answer this. But the concept just saying in the first stage that the local ATFM said, okay, if there's, there's a target time over, can you handle? And then the aircraft can say, no, I cannot handle, but I have a better kind of, uh, of approach. And then you can have this kind of uh, negotiation. You can see it's, it's balanced. But uh, what I mentioned, this is the problem of actual flight. There is a, another question is about, um, um, perhaps this was the first question, is, uh, is saying, that uh, at the beginning of the presentation, you, you, you mentioned that the message should be passed directly from ATFM or the body that is in charge of uh, handling ATFM to aircraft. And then yeah. the question is, uh, what about the air traffic controller and the awareness of air traffic controller if somehow they are skipped in this uh, activity? Yeah, um, I think this is, uh, when, when come to operations, there have to some, there have to be some problems solved. So it's uh, it could be some uh, some points that the workload of the controller will be increased because now you have not only to manage local aircraft but also aircraft five hours away, or yes, at least to guess what, what happens with them. We are aware of this, but we are at this stage we are not focusing. This is more the general idea and try to find out okay if there's a chance. But you are right. We uh, at the given stage ATC should be part of this process. And I believe this the same person is asking. Um, um, well, obviously, uh, perhaps you already answered this question, but he's saying, okay, but what happens if obviously flights may have clearances to fly direct to, to destination or, you know, in yeah. the... I think this is kind of what I mentioned before, the negotiation process, if the aircraft is saying, I cannot handle this TDO, uh, the target time over, I have some troubles, uh, there is a chance just to say no. So I think this will be part of a kind of negotiation. So it's, it's a normal process in CDM. So it's like, okay, if you're not taking this, are you able to handle this? And then it's kind of process, yeah. Then also here we have something that I don't know if it's more a comment or a question, but it's saying, okay, uh, obviously um, you apply this um, concept as a, a tool for demand management. Yeah. But uh, this may also be comparison in terms of fuel. So I believe yeah. there, shouldn't, there shouldn't be any problem about this. And, uh, uh, but yeah. maybe yeah. you can the, comment. The, 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 point is, the point is from traffic flow management side, honestly, you're not really care about what's the problem of the particular aircraft. But this is very known by the aircraft itself or by, by the pilots or by the, by the airliners. So this kind of negotiation process should make sure that you uh, somehow include uh, this kind of, uh, of process as well. So if you ask, for example, the aircraft, if there is, is there a chance to, to increase the speed by uh, one, uh, 0.01 uh, Mach, because then you would help us somehow with capacity problems. And then the airliner can say, okay, yeah, it, it's, we'll, uh, it's okay for us as well, because in our constraints, we will be a little bit easier uh, in, in not going into holdings, for example. This kind of negotiation has to, negotiation has to be done, yeah. Um, well, we are almost uh, close to 10.30, but uh, a couple of more questions. Um, this is perhaps more curiosity. Did you interact with any airspace user about this concept? Because at the end, you know, they are those that uh, basically will uh, uh, implement. <laughs> Yeah, um, sorry for not having this completely in my mind, but there was a test scenario, I think with New Zealand and Australia and the CAS. Um, so the, the, the Singaporean uh, authorities, and they already tested this. So there was, uh, there were, they somehow implemented um, this kind of speed advisory, speed regulations, and they find that it's manageable. So, and we implemented this in the airtop I would say a fast time simulation environment as well. And then we can see it's handleable by the system in, in general terms. Um, so yeah, there is, there is some interaction was, was given. And I personally think this concept will be ready in the next 
two or three years because, uh, as I said before, this kind of multinodal ADFM is already active. So the ADFM units already talk to each other, try to find good solutions for the day of operations. And I think this kind of concept will help to push this a little bit further. Okay, so basically to conclude about this point, I believe that there is already a consensus from at least some uh, airspace user or stakeholders yeah. about yeah. implementing this process. Well, thank you uh, again for your contribution. Uh, we have now a second speaker is uh, Pavin Juntamana, and uh, hopefully I uh, pronounce correctly his name, is going to talk about our traffic satirization based on linear dynamical system. And Pavin is a French engineer um, in electronics and now is pursuing his PhD in computer science and applied math at ENAC. And obviously, well, his research uh, focuses in our traffic complexity metrics, meteoristics, optimization, and machine learning. So I leave the floor to Pavin for his contribution and he will start with the video. Good morning, okay. everyone. And welcome to the CISA Innovation Days. I would like to present my work entitled Air Traffic Structuration Based on Linear Dynamical Systems. My work is supported by INAC from Toulouse in collaboration with ATMRI from Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Firstly, I will introduce problem context and ideas to address the problem and objectives in this work. After that, I will present the problem formulation and resolution algorithms that we propose in this work. And you will see our result from different scenarios. And you will see finally our conclusions and future works. So let's see some statistics and trends. As you can see, the five routes around the world in 2018. The number of the five routes will have doubled in the next 15 years. Particularly in European airspace, in 2019, the traffic had a peak over 30,000 flights a day. And now, increasing in air traffic demand is causing the congestion and delays due to limited capacity. It's a challenge that most cases cannot be answered by expanding infrastructure or improving the current ATM system. An interesting solution is to increase efficiency by adapting demand to capacity. So now I would like to show you the relation between capacity and ATC workload. In the current ATM system, the airspace capacity is defined from the maximum amount of workload that the air traffic controllers can use their ability to provide safe and efficient traffic flow through the airspace sectors. After this slide, you will see risk factors affecting the controller workload. Regarding with the research from NASA in 1995, not only the sector characteristic or configuration can increase the control level load, but also the traffic structure or patterns is a major source factor affecting the control level load in terms of uh, traffic complexity. Let me show you how traffic patterns affect the capacity with two comparative situations in the same sector. For the first situation, the easy pattern of the traffic allow the controller to accept a twin aircraft entering the sector. But not for the second situation. The traffic pattern is hardly predictable. The controller cannot accept the aircraft more than the eight aircraft in control sector. So now you have seen sometimes the controllers can accept more number of aircraft over capacity threshold. But for the other time, the controllers limit the number of aircraft very far from threshold. In this work, we would like to find a solution to adapt the traffic patterns for increasing more demand to actual capacity. So we propose the air traffic structuration solution. The expected outcomes from this solution is that we can organize traffic into flows and we can reduce the controller mental overload. And our solution can create a condition to increase the capacity. And the solution is finally offer controllers to predict traffic situations to improve the situational awareness. So here are the objectives of our research. The first one, we formulate the medical model for the traffic structuration in the trajectory-based operation environment. 
And then we propose a new hotspot detection. It's a trajectory-based complexity metric so that the traffic is modeled as a linear dynamical systems. And then we introduce the optimization algorithm with the incorporation of the reinforcement learning for the resolution process. So in the next section, I will present the optimization problem for the traffic structuration. Let me introduce our optimization architecture. First, we have initial five plans, alternative five plans, and as space configurations. And then we simulate the traffic. The simulated trajectories we use to compute the complexity, and we try to perform optimization process to restructure the trajectories and finally, we will get the optimal trajectories. To formulate the problem, our decision variable allow us to change the departure time and reroute the traffic using waypoints. And constant variables are the maximum departure time that we can ship within the maximum at once or delay time. And the maximum route length that aircraft can be deviated from the flight route. And the maximum number of waypoints to build the alternative route. And the objective functions is to minimize the traffic complexity. For the objective functions, the air traffic complexity, we propose an intrinsic complexity that we can use the aircraft position and speed vector to calculate the complexity. And we model the traffic using a um, linear dynamical system and then compute the complexity. Our metric can quantify the disorder level or the level of difficulty of air situations. To build the complexity metric in linear dynamical system, we prepare the set of position and speed observation at instant of time. And we will determine a linear dynamical model which is best fitted to observations using linear least square estimation. So we have got the metric A and vector B to create this linear model. And we use the metric A to extract the eigenvalues of system. The eigenvalues are used to calculate the complexity. And finally, we got the complexity metric. To understand how complexity can quantify the level of difficulty, these four examples situations can demonstrate the unique complexity by location of the eigenvalue. For the first one, for when aircraft fly in parallel, the distance between aircraft remain unchanged with time, and eigenvalues are both zero. When the aircraft fly in convergent movement, the relative position tend to be lower with time. Eigenvalues become large in real negative value. Unlikely in divergence situation, relative position tend to be higher with time. Eigenvalues become large in real positive value. Finally, when aircraft fly in rotation direction, the eigenvalues perfectly exit in the imaginary part. This table shows the eigenvalues and our complexity metric for each situation based on the characteristic of the situation. Only the convergent situations can cause the traffic congestion so that we apply only uh, the real negative eigenvalues to compute our complexity metric. In reality, we compute the complexity metric for every sample vector in aircraft trajectory. This picture shows how to calculate the metric of aircraft I at time TK. And complexity of aircraft I at time TK can be calculated based on uh, position and speed of aircraft I and neighboring aircraft within a particular area which relate to the mental picture of controller that can uh, manage the situations. And to calculate a full complexity of an aircraft, we can combine our complexity of each sample vector for entire trajectory. This section is also our contribution, the resolution algorithm which allow to minimize the complexity of traffic. And for the resolution process, we use the adaptive uh, meta heuristic based on a reinforcement learning. The algorithm is based on the hyper heuristic approach that focuses on the adaptive searching strategy. And we also apply the online learning with the reinforcement learning. An algorithm can generate a neighborhood solution with the heuristic operators. And the two types of low-level heuristic operator is intensification operators and 
diversification operators. And the solution acceptance used in this framework is the metabolic criterion. Let's see our conceptual design of the AMRR. First, we have a, a general framework of the hyperheuristic. And the framework has a, the high-level strategy separated from the problem domain. In the problem domain, we have a set of the low-level heuristics, which allow the system to generate the neighborhood decision. And a set of decisions. Each decision contains an action to modify the trajectory of a graph and complexity associated with the action. And also we have three major components on the high-level strategy. First one, the reinforcement learning is learn how to select the operator and reward the heuristic operators after improving the decisions. And we have the heuristic selections to select the heuristic operator based on the high reward to modify the current decision. And then the heuristic operator is applying to the current decision with the period decision. The value of complexity will send to the value acceptance. The move acceptance operation we access or reject the new decision with the metropolis criterion. So the experience of the solution acceptance will be recorded in memory to compute the future reward to the heuristic operators by reinforcement learning. So let me introduce the heuristic operators for the traffic structuration. The first group is the intensification heuristic operator. And we have the H1, 5 at once is the is used to advance the departure time within five minutes and the h2 the five delay is used to delay the departure time within five minutes randomly and the h3 is used to move a single waypoint for to change the five route and the h4 to move two or more waypoints can be moved to generate a new five route and the latter is uh, the diversification heuristic operator. And the first one is the H5, 20 shifts. It's used to at once or delay departure time within 20 minutes. And the S6, the new route, is to generate randomly the new route without condition. And S7, flip opposite, the system will flip the route in vertical. And the H8, remove or insert the synchronous waypoint to change the route. Let's go to the results section. To evaluate our approach for our test scenarios, we have three short-term planning, flow crossing, time-based metering, and traffic and cartons. And other two long-term planning scenarios to test our algorithm, the traffic in the front as space and the same traffic, but considering time uncertainty. The first scenario is flow crossing. This scenario allows us to adjust the flight time to manage an interaction of three traffic flow. In this situation, we can identify the congestion with the complexity metric. And the resolution algorithm can reschedule the flights entering the sector with optimal complexity. And the time-based metering. This scenario is to adjust the flight time to merge three traffic into a single flow. In this situation, we can identify the congestion with the complexity metric when two or more aircraft fly to a merging point. And the resolution algorithm can reschedule the flight entering the sector with near zero complexity. And the traffic encounters. This scenario allows us to build the temporary routes to avoid the risk of collision. In this situation, we can identify the congestion with the complexity metric when two flows create a risk of collision. And the resolution algorithm can restructure two parallel flow of traffic to minimize the traffic complexity. These results show the near zero complexity and it gives the, an easy pattern to manage the traffic. For trajectory planning in the long term, we test with real traffic over front air space more than 8,000 aircraft presented in this traffic. This picture shows the complexity map of initial trajectories. This metric can detect some hotspots in airspace. In the next picture, our resolution algorithm can minimize the impact of structure to 50% from initial flight plans. In this scenario, we can compute less than 4 minutes computation time and less than 5 minutes for the average departure time tips 
as 0.12% for average root deviation. The last one, we consider time uncertainty which can be induced by network problems, passenger delays, or unknown situations at the airport. Not only observation at actual time, we also include the observation at adjacent time for the complexity calculation. This table reports the final results from structuring the French traffic, considering time uncertainty. For sure that is consume more computation time and initial complexity is higher when we increase the uncertainty in time. But we found a significant decrease in final complexity. When we consider time uncertainty, more information produces the high number of uh, sequencing patterns that can lower the overall complexity. So finally, the conclusion in this work. We have been formulated a traffic structuration problem with alternative time of departure and en route trajectory. And we developed a trajectory-based complexity metric for hotspot detection. And to minimize the complexity in the traffic, we structure the traffic by proposing the adaptive metaheuristic optimization using the reinforcement learning. Our algorithm has been applied to real traffic at national scale. Our algorithm also takes time uncertainty into account for this problem. For our perspective and future work, we aim to develop our approach for the traffic at continental scale and other tactical situation based on our complexity metric. And we will pay more attention on performance analysis at sector level. And we also improve our learning mechanisms with the other approach like the Q-learning extension. Thank you very much for your attention. We welcome all of your questions and wish you have a good journey in CESA Innovation Days. Okay, uh, yeah, I, w I still have a problem with the mic, so I was able to unmute. Uh, sorry for this uh, quick delay. Okay. So thank you very much for your video, Pavin. Uh, we have a few questions. And the first one is about uh, if you can provide a little more detail about the measure of traffic complexity and how it is this complexity related to the air traffic controller workload. So uh, there are a few questions about this. So if you can provide some more information, uh, that would be great. The traffic complexity in my the context of the research is um, how is uh, the traffic is difficulty for controllers to manage the traffic. So um, the traffic complexity, when we, when the, the, the complexity in the traffic has uh, increased, the controllers is, uh, uh, find it difficult to, uh, to manage the situation, like uh, um, to estimate uh, the potential conflict, by example. So, so that uh, our approach is to plan to reduce complexity. Maybe it can be integrated to um, the demand and capacity balancing process. So that uh, we need to adapt the traffic uh, to the capacity so that uh, we allowed controllers to manage more aircraft in the, in the limited capacity so that we, we try to increase the flow into the capacity. Yeah. Thank you. First question. Okay, uh, we have uh, another question. Uh, this is about that, uh, you know, the trajectory. So your approach is trying to compute um, optimal trajectory, meaning the trajectory that minimizes the complexity. And this might lead to an increase of capacity. Uh, and then the question is, um, are you considering the preferred trajectory of the, for the individual aircraft or for the individual flight? Exactly. I, um, I uh, compute the complexity for every trajectory. And then the, for, for every trajectory of aircraft, we have the individual complexity. And we, 
And finally, we combined our complexity and we uh, performed the optimization process to, uh, to minimize the overall complexity. But actually, the algorithms is, uh, is applied to each aircraft to, to minimize the complexity for, for each aircraft. But uh, the overall complexity can be minimized as well. Thank you. Uh, on this, I have a, a, a follow up of mine, um, a question. Because here you are applying um, operator that somehow combine different trajectories in order to produce the final trajectory of a flight. Um, and the outcome, it cannot be that you get a trajectory that is not really what the uh, airspace user is willing to fly. Because you may have a lot of, you know, zigzag. So, okay. It, it reduces um, the complexity, but uh, perhaps it's not really what the uh, airspace user is willing to fly. So, that's, uh, I'm, I'm just wondering if you can perhaps uh, shed some light on this. Um, if I under understand where well your question is um, for, for the short term planning, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I believe that um, this approach, and indeed there is also a question on this, this is about designing um, trajectory in order to resolve hotspot and not really yeah. about structuring their space. That was the other ah, Yes, question. okay. Um, for, we, we try to develop the, the heuristic operator to uh, modify the shape of the trajectory that can um, Yes, it's, uh, it's not easy to validate the result that uh, the structure is, is, is more easy for our controllers, but uh, we use the complexity to, to measure, and we believe that uh, the complexity, uh, our complexity metrics can, um, can form better the structure that uh, minimize the difficulty to manage the traffic by controllers. Okay, so in, in this case, uh, your focus is mostly on the uh, workload of air traffic controller. So basically reduce the complexity measure of the traffic and in some sense to, to increase or to reduce the workload of air traffic controller. Uh, and not as much on the uh, final trajectory for their lines or their space users. Uh -huh. I'm asking okay. because we have also a, a, an additional question from Eugenio de Zalevi, and, and so that's why I'm, I'm, I'm asking this. Okay, uh, Dr. Levy, okay, sorry. It's good for the grounds. Okay. It's, um, yeah, the, the, uh, we not uh, the final trajectory. We not yet validate for the airspace user, but uh, but uh, we um, for the for the, our algorithms, we we try to um, um, minimize the, the 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 minimize also the the, um, the 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 attempt to change the trajectory. But uh, <laughs> yes, I think the the, the final trajectory is not. Live is not uh, very different from the initial trajectories. Okay, so this is something that perhaps is is part of the uh, future development. Uh, I understand in order to uh, assess also the quality of the trajectory you will get. And um, again, uh, a curiosity or a question. You said that obviously your approach is able to handle uncertainty. Uh, if this is this approach is considered as a tool for uh, hotspot resolution, uh, I believe the type of answer the of uncertainty that you have is is quite small. And how did you handle this uncertainty? Uh, because okay. your your fly is already in some cases is already your aircraft is already on the in the air. So uh, then you know the obviously there is a certain uncertainty because it depends also on the type of action that are imposed before to reach the hotspot, but also is, is not that uh, you have such a large 
or huge uncertainty. So the, the question is, how did you handle this uncertainty in your approach? Okay, you mean the, the position uncertainty? Right. Well, you refer to time, but obviously the time and, and position are somehow related. Yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe uh, to um, um, the approach to minimize the complexity, we, the, um, we take the action on the, the macroscopic level. So that's um, the, the time is the time is a best part is a is a best parameter to 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 to, to, to take the uncertainty into account for the position. Uh, for the position or altitude uncertainty, um, I think we need to um, take care of the, 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 the high number of degree of freedom, but uh, but yes, we can and um, we can do in the future work for the for this uh, this problem. Okay, then uh, I believe more or less we address uh, all the questions that were uh, posed by our attendees. And uh, um, yeah, we are a little bit earlier. So I'm just wondering if there is any other question for both the okay. speaker that can be either uh, Pavin or Michael, and you're more than welcome yeah, sure. to, to, to ask. So we can use this uh, uh, last five minutes of the session or four minutes of the session in order to address any additional question that you may have. Anyhow, uh, uh, for Michael, uh, I just want to add that there was there was a comment from uh, Alan Clark, Adrian Clark, sorry, and um, he was saying that Nats work with uh, CAS and their New Zealand, and as far as the the acceptance of the concept, you know, some uh, airline were quite positive, but others were a little bit more cautious. So we will see what will happen about this long-term, uh, long-range, sorry, uh, air traffic management regulation. Uh, Michael, are you there? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So, uh, um, yeah, just to to tell you about this comment from Adrian Clark. Um, any other question for the speaker? So if there are no other questions for the speaker, uh, well, first of all, I would like to thank all of you for attending this uh, session uh, online. Um, uh, we had a very good talk and uh, very interesting. And obviously there is a, a lot to, to think about. And here just, uh, um, uh, there is a teaser video that perhaps uh, is going to show now. Do you want to know how to integrate airline robust operations into the network in a way that the network behaves in a resilient manner? Do you want to know how to take advantage of advanced artificial intelligence methods to do so? Well then, START project is your project. START project stands for Stable and Resilient Air Traffic Management by Integrating Robust Airline Operations into the Network. STAR project is coordinated by University of Charles III in partnership with Boeing Research and Development Germany, Istanbul Technical University, ENAC in Toulouse, FlyKeys, Flight Dispatching uh, Company, DLR in Germany, and uh, Polytechnic University of Catalonia. Do not miss the opportunity. Can come and visit us in our virtual booth at the Cesar Innovation Days 2020. Thanks very much for that. Hello everyone, this is Antonio Franco from the University of Seville and I'm here to encourage you to see the poster we have prepared regarding FMPMET project. This project will contribute to include the meteorological forecast uncertainty into the decision-making processes in air traffic management. In particular, FMPMET project focuses on the decisions to be made by the flow management position. The overall objective is to provide the FMP with an intuitive and interpretable probabilistic assessment of the impact of convective weather on operations, thanks to the combination of probabilistic demand, 
complexity and capacity reduction forecasts. Do you want to know more? Well, you will have to come to see the poster. Okay, thank you very much um, to all the attendees. So I wish you a, a wonderful day. But before to leave, I just want to leave you a brief information about the virtual networking event that is going to be uh, in a few minutes soon after. And in order to access this virtual networking event, you can either use the link that has been sent to you or you can use the WoA application that perhaps you downloaded on your mobile or on your computer. I wish all of you a very good day and an excellent Cesar Innovation Days. And hopefully see you soon, uh, maybe in an in-person uh, event. Uh, have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. And I just want to ask Pavin and Michael to stay here for one minute more. Thanks. <laughs>